So when I was 12 years old, growing up not far from here in Kansas City, I told my parents that I wanted to play football. My dad was puzzled. He, he looked at me and he said, you're a Schlossman. We don't run around and bash into each other. We don't do that. We go home, we study, we read books. Later, I remember having almost the exact same conversation right around the time of my bar mitzvah. And here my dad reminded me, we're Jewish, he said. Jewish people don't play football. And then, then at the risk of being repetitive, he repeated this very timely warning. He said, Jewish people don't run around and bash each other's heads in. They study, they go home, they read books. You know, my parents eventually did let me play, but my dad and I, we have this argument to this day. We had it over Thanksgiving. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you, dad, and everybody here in the audience to a really, really good offensive lineman. This is Mitchell Schwartz. Now, Mitchell Schwartz currently plays for the Kansas City Chiefs, and I like using him as an example because he helps me to push back a little, get, a little bit against my dad's objections. You see, Mitchell Schwartz is Jewish. <laughs> he also, incidentally, read a lot of books. I bet he still does. He's really smart. He graduated from Berkeley before going pro. So there, Dad, boom, drop that microphone, Steve out. Jewish guys play football, Jewish guys read books, and that's, of course, because all sorts of people play football, and all sorts of people read books. Now, you might be wondering while we're at it how my mom felt about all this, and if you are wondering, well, then you probably don't have a Jewish mother. <laughs> um, my mom never voiced her objections openly. She expressed her distaste in a more visceral way. Uh, she kind of got sick. Like, my mom gagged every time I got hit. Watching me play was literally bad for her health. I, I would look up into the stands and there would be my sweet, loving mother, grown all pale as folks kind of huddled around and tried to offer some solace. So I went out of my way to reassure my parents. I said, look at me. I'm not gonna play pro football. I am probably not gonna play in college. This is gonna be my only chance my only real opportunity to see why so many people love this game. Football is associated with so many good things. No one person can own a play. A, a quarterback, he, he bumbles the snap, or a lineman misses a block, a linebacker misses a tackle. All of that is more than enough to ruin the play. But you put that another way, a really well-executed play in football, well, that's a work of art. That's beauty, pure and simple. And the opportunity to take place in that heart in, in real time, that's a gift. I mean, think of the control. Think of the fact that a good football team goes full throttle when that ball is snapped and then stops on a dime when the whistle blows. Think of the lessons learned. But now here's the irony. Those lessons are learned in the brain and the very organ that football threatens and this poses a bit of a problem for me. Because you see, I'm a, I'm a brain doctor. Football threatens the very organ that I took an oath to protect. Football exploits the brains of adolescents, but also uniquely helps them to grow and to mature. And football exploits and unites entire communities. And this, this is why I struggle. I mean, something would be missing without football, I think, but then I ask myself, is football really worth saving? How do we save it? Why do we save it? I think these are societal questions that we have to ask now. Folks, as you can probably tell, I am so conflicted about this that I'm gonna ask all of you to join me in my conflict right now. I mean, guys who play football and enjoy it, they associate their time on the gridiron with this corny but heartfelt belief that life lessons are learned and imbibed and practices in ways that just could otherwise, otherwise never be experienced, right? They learn to control their impulsivity. They learn to push their bodies and minds to these amazing goals. They learn to work together as a team, that they're not alone in the world. Now, on the other hand, I talk every day in my professional life about the importance of keeping your body, your mind, your brain healthy and whole. So how do I square the clear data about the risk of playing football with my unwavering romance with this particularly American game? Am, am I violating my Hippocratic Oath? So to do this right, I, we gotta have some ground rules. First of all, lucky for me, 
Most people who play football, they don't look like Mitchell Schwartz, right? Most people who play football, they look more, more like me. Most people who play football, they don't go pro. That means at least as far as my professional conscience is concerned, I need to focus most on those kids who take their helmets off for the last time sometime during high school. Now the average youth football season is about nine games long. Let's say you practice five days a week with contact practice three of those five days and then you got a game on Friday or Saturday. And let's say you start playing football sometime around middle school. I'm not going to bore you with the math, but you should know that that works out to roughly 225,000 hits over the lifetime of an offensive lineman. My brain, my brain has endured nearly 300,000 hits because I played on the offensive line. And back when I played, pretty much all practices were full contact. And even, even if you're not on the offensive line, you're, if you're playing football, you're going to get hit. That's part of the fun of playing football. But each one of those hits is doing damage. Every study that's ever been done looking at neuroimaging or actual brain tissue has found that playing for as little as a single year causes significant changes in the brain. A recent study looked at 12-year-olds who played just one season and compared them to a control group who had never played. And in those 12-year-olds who played one season, there were significant changes in the corpus callosum of the brain. Now, because the corpus callosum comprises those fibers that allow the right and left hemisphere to talk to each other, damage to this region of the brain could disrupt the development of abstract thinking. Still, it's pretty clear that not everyone who plays football and who has changes that show up on neuroimaging go on to develop learning or behavioral problems. I mean, there's no way there's a 100% correlation. Just look at the numbers. In 2017, it was estimated that just under a million adolescents played football in this country. In that same year, if you look at kids ages eight and up, around five million people were playing football. But the number of people who developed behavioral problems, who played football and developed those problems before we might otherwise expect, it's clearly well below those numbers. In other words, my brain might be at significant risk, but statistically, it would be awfully hard to tease that apart from the, the family history that I have of dementia that already haunts my family. Right now, nobody has studied this. We don't know whether kids who stop after high school are at significant risk. They might not be at any risk, but most of the studies suggest that the risk is there. So what, what do we know? Well, we know kids who start playing football before the onset of puberty do worse. They have more depression, they have more head injuries, they have more neurocognitive problems, and these happen later in life. This has been found in a lot of kids. We think this is probably because a lot of really important brain development comes online in the run-up to puberty. Plus, think of your brain inside a jar. That jar is your skull. The biggest risk to a blow to the head is your brain sloshing around inside that jar so that it crashes into one side or the other. That's called a coup contra coup injury. And the best protection against that is the really strong neck muscles that can form only with the onset of puberty. So regardless of your thoughts about football, everyone agrees that folks should wait for the onset of puberty, usually around age 14, before they play. Now, I'm going to have other recommendations in a second, but before we get there, can I just ask a much more fundamental question, kind of the question my folks were asking me. Why in the world would anybody play this game? I mean, why would anybody take a risk? I recently sat down and had this discussion with the head coach in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I asked him why the heck his players play. I mean, none of them are on scholarship. MIT doesn't give scholarships. None of them go pro. While they're a pretty good team, they've won their division the last few years in a row, nobody goes at MIT only to play football. Almost everybody goes to MIT to take advantage of those impressive academic gifts that MIT has to offer. Now, why would these kids risk their very impressive brains by playing this really brutal game. I mean, this is MIT. These kids have really big brains. Even that guy. <laughs> you know, the coach even took advantage of those big brains. He said, we only get two hours a day for practice. How could I do this? And the player said, don't worry, we're engineers. We will help you design this. We'll work the problem. And they did. They designed this ultra-efficient practice that had cardiovascular conditioning on the sideline while the guys on the field ran the plays. So even though the other teams in the division were maybe stronger and faster, the guys at MIT were in better shape. They played solid football, and they outlasted the other teams throughout the entire season. 
So we were sitting there in the athletic department cafeteria, and we were talking about all this. And as we were talking, a bunch of his players came up to say hi. One guy, this huge guy, was about to have knee surgery. He came limping in. The quarterback had just played his final game of his football career, and he had broken his collarbone in the playoffs. They both walked away smiling, this huge smile. And with that, the coach got a little wistful. He threw the question back at me. He said, why did you play? I still dream about playing, I said. Me too, he admitted. And then he offered this evolutionary theory. Maybe he said there's something about learning how to take a hit and get back up, or whether you should stay back down. Maybe we select for that trait. Maybe by selecting for these primitive life lessons, we set ourselves up to better pursue happiness and success. Is it possible that the very game that threatens our brain also uniquely programs our brain to better cope with the world? A, a recent study out of Cornell University looked at kids who play contact sports and then went on in, into business, and they found that kids who played football and lacrosse did much, much better. They, they made more money, they had impressive managerial skills, they had more leadership skills. And other studies have found the same thing. But let me tell you something else. Football's not going away, right? I mean, it's too much a part of American culture. It would be easier, I guess, if football were just outlawed. Then I wouldn't have to wring my hands about this. But football, it's so much a part of what we are. I think any attempt to ban it would just be met with this stubborn digging in at which Americans so often grandly excel but we can make some changes. Our first change, it's a violent game, but we don't have to glorify the violence. I've met coaches who tell their players how to injure players on the other team. That's a crime, that's the definition of a crime. Nobody signs up to play football to get hurt on purpose, or at least nobody should. Secondly, nobody should play until the onset of puberty. We need those neck muscles strong enough and those brains developed enough to absorb the blows that come with the game. Third, Everyone who plays should wear a net guard. This will not prevent head injuries or concussions, but it will prevent the risk of a fractured neck when the back of the helmet gets pushed back towards the spinal cord. If everybody wears the same net guard, then everyone is similarly limited in the way they can turn their head. I would much rather limit the way you can turn your head than run the risk of paralysis. Fourth, and this is more about the culture of football, never ever make somebody play. I mean, there's no reason on earth that kids who play football should be celebrated more than kids who aren't. The, the kind of privilege that comes with playing football has been associated with all sorts of bad outcomes for players and has really damaged the reputation of the game itself. Finally, given that the hit, the risk is in hitting, why don't we hit each other less, right? I mean, the Canadian Football League, it's gotten rid of contact altogether during practice. The Ivy League has gotten rid of tackling during practice. The team at MIT, they go a bunch of different speeds and they only hit when they're going full speed and they rarely go full speed except during the game. So these changes are better for our brain. Less hitting means less injury. They make football measurably safer. What happens to football, it's up to all of us. It's up to you. It's up to me, it's up to parents and fans and people who don't like the game or people just indifferent as to whether the game survives. Think of how many people are playing. We all have a stake in this. And I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm trying to complicate your thinking. And I'm asking you to do that with the very organ that football puts most at risk. We're not gonna change American culture, that's too hard. But we can change the culture of football and I think we have to if we want football to survive. That, that's our dilemma in a nutshell. Or I guess, in a football helmet. Thank you very much.